Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about the regulation of transcription in eukaryotes, and more specifically, in multicellular organisms. Now, when we're looking at the regulation of transcription, we're looking at this level here, okay? The regulation of the activation of transcription, the production of RNA. But what we're learning is that the activation of transcription is really also tied to the regulation of uh, DNA packaging, of, of chromatin structure. That the two are really linked to one another in that oftentimes the, whether or not you can turn on a gene is dependent upon whether or not this chromatin is accessible to the machinery of transcription. And so the various transcription factors that bind to DNA are going to be involved in, instead of recruiting RNA polymerase, will oftentimes be involved in modifying chromatin to unpackage it or to recruit other proteins. So these two processes here, the regulation of chromatin packaging and the regulation of transcription, are really linked. There are other points of regulation of gene expression. If we're looking at the regulation of gene expression, meaning taking that information within the gene and translating it all the way to protein, there's many other levels that can be regulated as well. And we've looked at one of those here, the regulation of messenger RNA degradation and the regulation of whether a messenger RNA is gonna be translated in the first place by microRNAs. Okay, so, we have already talked a little bit about this, that once there is access to the DNA, that there are two necessary components we need to look at. And the first is the regulatory sequences, whether we're talking about, so they, they can be called control elements or enhancers or regulatory sequences, right? These are all uh, sequences of DNA to which protein binds. Now, they can often be far upstream, they could be downstream. If we were to compare various organisms here and look at the regulatory sequences, what you would see is if you compare increasingly complex organisms, you will see increasingly complex regulatory sequences. Especially dramatic is when you go from single-celled organism like yeast to a multicellular organism like humans, you get a very dramatic increase in regulatory sequences. And so the reason for that is that once you have a multicellular organism, some cells are never going to express some genes and other cells are going to express a completely different subset of genes. And this added complexity in the regulation of gene expression is mirrored in the atom, the complexity in the way these genes are regulated. And I have an important question down here. If we were to take a look at this gene here, let's say this this human gene with its accompanying uh, regulatory sequence. I've got a question. Are the regulatory sequences for a gene the same in all cells? This is a fundamental question, and it's more tricky than what you would think. The answer is yes, right? This is part of the gene, or this, this is associated with this gene. This is associated with the chromosome. You are initially a single cell with 30,000 genes, and that cell divides and divides and divides, as does the DNA. And so if the DNA started like this in your zygote when you were a single-celled embryo, then every single copy of this gene in all of your various cells will have this exact same DNA. So, it's important to understand that the sequence of DNA, of your regulatory sequences that control when and where a particular gene is going to be transcribed, is identical in all cells.
Now, again, we're coming back to this idea that what's important are active, uh, are also necessary are the activators. Activators are the specific transcription factors necessary to bind to these control elements. So for example, we talked about one in quite a bit of detail with the lac operon, and that's the cap binding protein that binds to the cap binding site um, that is just upstream of the promoter of the lac operon. And then we have the activation domain. Now, in prokaryotes, oftentimes the activation domain of a specific transcription factor directly interacts with RNA polymerase. That is not the case, however, for eukaryotes. For eukaryotes, the activation domain of specific transcription factors binds to all kinds of other things that will indirectly help RNA polymerase bind to the promoter. So, what are some of the things that eukaryotic activators bind to? What are some of the other types of proteins that they will interact with if it's not RNA polymerase directly? And there's three classes of protein that eukaryotic activators recruit. They might recruit elements of the transcriptional machinery. So that would be things like the TF2D, TF2A, TF2B, and so on and so forth. It might be various chromatin remodeling complexes. These are protein complexes that change the stretch of DNA that's wound around a nucleosome core. And they might interact with and recruit histone and terminal tail modifying proteins. Okay. For example, you guys are reading the paper on JMJD3 and UTX. These would be uh, that sorts of proteins that an activator might recruit. Okay, so let's start with um, <clears throat> elements of the transcriptional machinery. <clears throat> so here's an example of that. <clears throat> so here is the DNA sequence, our enhancer. Here is the activator binding to that with its DNA binding domain. And with its activation domain, it recruits mediator, which is a large protein complex necessary for the binding of RNA polymerase to the promoter. And it can interact with some of the general transcription factors. For example, here, TF2D. So in that way, our activator is recruiting this, this machinery, this transcriptional machinery, without binding directly to RNA polymerase. All right, next, the uh, activator can recruit chromatin modifying proteins or chromatin remodeling complexes. So here's our activator. Its DNA binding site is binding to a sequence of DNA here. Okay. Its activation domain right here then recruits a nucleosome repositioning complex. Okay. So normally this this nucleosome repositioning complex would never bind to this region unless the activator is present within the cell, unless the activator binds to its binding site, and only then does that activator then recruit this nucleosome repositioning complex. What does it do? It changes the stretch of DNA that is wound around a particular nucleosome. And so that's what we see here. This is uh, a right here in green would be one of these nucleosome repositioning complexes and what it sort of does is kind of pinch the DNA and unwinds it around that nucleosome. In this image here on the left it's a little bit easier to understand is when you reposition the DNA that's wrapped around a particular uh, histone core what you end up with is now DNA binding sites that were covered up by the nucleosome are now exposed and that can then recruit the RNA polymerase transcriptional machinery. <clears throat> now, nucleosome repositioning complexes themselves, so here are a whole bunch of them. You do not have to memorize any of them, but what I want you to know 
is that these repositioning complexes, so these this big purple molecule here, are large proteins, and they often have domains called histone binding domains. Now, this isn't important for the, the particular example that we're showing you here. It's going to be important for the next uh, example. So these histone binding domains are protein domains that allow these proteins to bind to specifically modified histones. Bromo domains and chromo domains are going to be the two important ones that we're going to talk about in a little bit of detail. So I want you to keep in mind, uh, and we'll, we'll get back to them in a minute. <clears throat> All right. The third class of protein that the activation domains of eukaryotic specific transcription factors is uh, that N-terminal modifying proteins like histone methyltransferases, histone demethylases, etc., etc. And so this is how this would work. Here again is our DNA binding site in green. Our activator binds to it because its DNA binding domain binds to the uh, binding site. And then the activation domain recruits this time in this particular example, a histone acetyltransferase. Now this histone acetyltransferase would never modify any of the histones here. The only reason it's doing that now is it's be being recruited by this activator. And the only reason this activator is there is because it's binding to the binding site that happens to be right there. So the activator binds because it's being expressed in the cell and it binds to these binding sites. It then recruits a histone acetyltransferase and that histone acetyltransferase then does what it does is it adds acetyl groups to specific N-terminal tails of histones. And that then does one of two things. It actually could do both. One is it changes the packaging of that DNA around the nucleosome so that maybe the promoter of a gene is now exposed. There is uh, several different types of enzymes that will uh, catalyze modifications on N-terminal tails of histones. There are histone acetyltransferases, so these add acetyl groups. There are histone deacetylases, these remove acetyl groups from N-terminal tails. There are histone methyltransferases that add methyl groups to various R groups of amino acids within these N-terminal tails of histones. There are histone demethylases. So for example, histone H3K27 demethylase, your JMJD3, your UTX that you guys are learning about. Now these are oftentimes, for example, in histone H3K27 are extremely specific enzymes. They catalyze, for example, the addition of methyl groups or the removal of methyl groups from very specific amino acids and very specific histones. <clears throat> and so with this figure here, you can see that we have H2A, H2B, H3, H4. These are the four different histone proteins involved in the histone octamer of a nucleosome. These are the N-terminal tails that extend out from that nucleosome core, and they are the substrate for lots and lots of these different enzymes and therefore um, the various modifications. So I'll just remind you that in the paper you guys are reading, the two amino acids that are very important for the subject of the paper are in histone H3. So there's our K27, our lysine 27 that can be trimethylated or it can be demethylated. And there's that histone uh, H3K4, fourth lysine here, that again can be modified, can be methylated and demethylated. And depending upon what, how, these are, uh, um, how, how these are methylated will determine whether or not the gene that they are near will be turned on or be turned off. <clears throat> so, these N-terminal histone tail modifications serve to do two things. The first, and what I have already mentioned, is they can help pack or unpack DNA. The second 
is that they can serve as a docking site for various proteins. So let's take a look at packaging. Well, if you were to take a look at chromosomes, you would see that part of some of the chromosomes would have a region that is open. Okay, we call that euchromatin, and this is regions of active transcription. You'll see a lot of acetylation of these N-terminal tails. The chromatin will be a little bit more open, and that will allow access to genes by the transcriptional machinery. Now, you can change the modification such that you close up that chromatin, and now it's packaged very tight. And we call that type of chromatin heterochromatin. These are going to be regions of a chromosome that um, have no transcription. So that's one way that N, the modification of N-terminal tails can change gene expression by either packaging it tightly in heterochromatin or package things uh, loosely as euchromatin. They can also, these N-terminal tail modifications, not only can change the packaging of chromatin, but can serve as docking sites for very specific proteins. And so they almost act as a, as a code that are read by proteins. <clears throat> for example, there are some proteins like the chromatin modifying proteins that have bromo domains. This is the domain of a protein that gives that protein the ability to bind to histones with acetylated tails. So here is a protein. It has a bromo domain. It will bind to histones with acetylated tails. <clears throat> Chromo domains are going to be domains of proteins that are uh, that give that protein the ability to bind to methylated tails. So we've got some modifications here where some of these uh, N-terminal tails have been methylated. Well, that will attract specific proteins that have chromo domains, and there they bind. So what this does is this presents a code. This various modifications of the N-terminal tails will present a code that is read by specific proteins. Okay, do we have a couple of acetylated tails, a couple of chromo um, uh, and um, methylated tails? Boom, this protein recognizes that code, binds to it. Now, what's the significance of this? What is the significance of these proteins binding to the specific tail? Well, oh, here's just a reminder of the nucleosome repositioning complexes. Well, a protein with chromo domains, a protein with bromo domains that, that, that bind to a specifically modified region of chromatin, what do they then do? Well, they can recruit more histone modifying proteins. Or maybe they can recruit nucleosome repositioning proteins. Or maybe they are nucleosome repositioning proteins. Or maybe these proteins that have the chromo and bromo domains that bind to specifically modified N-terminal tails, maybe they themselves then recruit activators or repressors of transcription. So, what we have then is this complex choreography that is occurring around the promoter. So it's occurring at these uh, enhancer sites, at these regulatory sequences that occurs in order for a gene to be activated. Now this is a general example, and let's take a look at what we have going on here. So here we have a in blue is a DNA binding site that is bound by a specific transcription factor. And then we have in darker blue the promoter of a gene that is tied up within a nucleosome so that it cannot be accessed by the transcriptional machinery. So how does that open up and how do we eventually get the transcription of that gene? If the cell expresses this transcription factor, it will bind to its binding region here, to its control element. Well, it has an activation domain. What does that do? It recruits 
what's called a co-activator in this particular context. But specifically what this co-activator is, is it is a histone transacetylase. And so it is going to acetylate a whole bunch of lysine residues on the end terminal tails of the histones. Okay, now we have a specifically modified set of end terminal tails here. What do they do? Well, they are recognized by a protein that has, right, chromo and bromo domains, those specific domains that allow this protein to bind to specifically modified chromatin. What binds there? Aha, it's a chromatin remodeling engine. It is a protein that changes the stretch of DNA that's wrapped around a particular nucleosome. So what does it do? It changes the stretch of DNA that's wrapped around this nucleosome that it's bound to, that then exposes the, uh, the promoter. So now the RNA polymerase is, it's just been waiting for this. And now it's open, the RNA polymerase and that whole transcriptional machinery binds to it. And now we get the production of an RNA. We get activation of transcription. So what we need to look at here is that this is a nice general example, but oftentimes the turning on of a gene is dependent on more than one DNA binding site. It is combinations of control elements that lead to gene expression. So let's take a look at what I mean by that. Here is the albumin gene within humans. Here is the crystalline gene. This is the promoter of each of those. And here's the regulatory sequence. And notice there is for each three control elements, each one bound by an activator. And so it is requires a combination of activators to turn on a particular gene. And because it's dependent on this combination, of activators in order for that gene to be turned on, the genome requires less activators. So let's think about it. If each of the 30,000 genes required a unique activator to turn it on, we would need 30,000 activators. But instead, if those activators are used over and over and over again in different combinations with other activators, aha, then we need less. We need less activators. What do I mean by that? Well, notice both of these, right? Both of these control, or excuse me, regulatory sequence depend upon a gray activator. We're, we're reusing that gray activator that binds to this gray control element. But that alone isn't what turns on this gene. Now, to get the albumin gene turned on, you need the gray activator, the yellow activator, and the red activator. To turn on the crystalline gene, you need the gray activator, the pink activator, and the orange activator. It's combinations of activators that turns on these genes. And it's this combinator combinatorial control that allows the genome to require fewer activators. We use the ones we have in different combinations. So let's take a look here of how this works. What we have then is the two genes that I was just saying. Crystalline gene, albumin gene, albumin gene, crystalline gene. And as I said way in the beginning of this lecture, is that if you look at two different cells, a lens cell and a liver cell, and you look at the DNA of each of these genes, it's absolutely identical. The albumin gene within the lens cell has the same regulatory sequence, red, gray, yellow. Same regulatory sequence, red, gray, yellow. Same thing with the crystalline gene. Okay, uh, That would be, let's call that orange, gray, pink, orange, gray, pink. However, in order for a lens cell to be a lens cell, it doesn't need albumin protein, but it does need crystalline protein. So only the crystalline gene is going to be turned on, even though it does have the albumin gene. We know this is the case from the experiments about Dolly the sheep. 
That showed genomic equivalence. That showed that all cells, no matter how specialized, have all genes. If we look at a liver cell that needs albumin but doesn't need crystalline, then we have expression of the albumin gene but not expression of the crystalline gene, even though it has both. So what's the difference? If both cells have both genes and both genes have the identical regulatory sequences, then what determines which genes are going to be turned on and which genes are going to be turned off? And the answer is it depends upon the available activators. What activators are being expressed in that cell? In the liver cell, we've got our yellow, we've got our gray, we've got our uh, red activators, and therefore albumin is going to be turned on. Even though we have the gray, remember we also need that combination. We need the pink, we need the orange. Those activators aren't being made within that cell, so crystalline doesn't get turned on. In the lens cell, we have the, uh, the orange activator, I guess that's, yeah, orange activator, the gray activator, and the pink activator, and so crystalline gets turned on. But even though we have the gray activator, we don't have the yellow, we don't have the red, and so the albumin gene is not being expressed. So the question becomes then, if it's so important to know what activators are available, what activators are are, are being made within the cell, what determines whether this, for example, what determines whether this particular red activator is being made within that cell? Well, activators are proteins. Proteins are encoded by a gene. Whether or not a gene is turned on is dependent upon its regulatory sequence. So let's take a look at that. So here we're making, um, we are differentiating a cell to be, make it become a muscle cell. And so in order to become a muscle cell, it needs to turn on all of the genes necessary to make muscles. So muscle proteins like myosin and things like that. How do those genes get turned on? Well, there's an activator that binds to the regulatory sequences and turns them on. And it's only if these activators are being made that these proteins or these genes are gonna be turned on. So, what determines whether or not these activators are gonna be made? Well, these activators are encoded by a gene. What determines whether that gene is gonna be transcribed? Well, that cell has to have activators in order to turn that on. So, we have these uh, activators that turn on other activators. And, some of these are so important that they can turn on all of the genes necessary for an entire developmental pathway. So for example, this activator here that, that gets turned on is called MyoD, and MyoD turns on a gene that encodes another activator that turns on all the genes necessary to make a muscle cell. Master regulatory genes that control complete developmental pathways are interesting because it gives us an idea of how the evolution of body form can occur with very few mutations. So for example, the antennapedia gene encodes the antennapedia activator. And that antennapedia activator turns on all the genes necessary to turn on, um, to, to convert cells into uh, leg cells. And the whole production to make legs. So the question is, what happens if a mutation occurs within the enhancer region that controls the expression of the antennapedia gene such that now it's being expressed in cells that would normally give rise to antennae? Well, researchers have done that. And what they saw is that suddenly the antennae become legs. Now, I want to stress this. The mutation that I'm talking about here is not a mutation that changed the protein structure of the antennapedia activator. It simply changed where the antennapedia activator is going to be produced, in what cells it's going to be produced. And in that way, you can start to see how the evolution of body form is possible. 
is that it doesn't depend upon single mutations in each one of these three leg genes. It simply depends upon one mutation that occurs somewhere in the regulation of the antennapedia gene. So, if that's the case, if what, cell, what genes get turned on in any particular cell is dependent upon which activators it makes, and that we are made up of 270 different cell types and therefore lots of different cells are expressing lots of different activators, then when does that asymmetry first start? We have all derived from a single celled embryo called a zygote. And if all cells derive from that, then where did this and how did this asymmetry start? How did one set of cells start making these activators and another set of cells made these activators? That's what we're going to look at next. How did differences in cell types first occur? And we'll look at that the next lecture.